giving chase. She scrambled up onto the platform, clapping her hands over her head, Dr. Fanning lunging at but missing her as she escaped onto center stage. The dancers good-naturedly made way. Dr. Fanning did not follow, but with an angry shrug of his shoulders, headed back to their table. Let her enjoy herself, Sandy's mother said. Her voice was full of phony good cheer. She is just having a good time. She's had too much to drink is what she's had, the doctor snapped. The restaurant came alive with the American ladies clowning. She was a good ham, bumping her hips up against the male dancers and rolling her eyes. The diners laughed and clapped. The management, sensing a good moment, gave her a spotlight, and the guitarist came forward, strumming a popular American tune with a Spanish flair. One of the male dancers partnered Mrs. Fanning who advanced as the dancer withdrew in a pantomime of a cartoon chase. The diners roared their approval. All but Sandy. Mrs. Fanning had broken the spell of the wild and beautiful dancers. Sandy could not bear to watch her. She turned her chair around to face the table and occupied herself with her water glass, twisting the stem around, making damp links on the white cloth. To a round of applause, Mrs. Fanning was escorted back to the table by her partner. Sandy's father stood up and pulled her chair out for her. Let's go. Dr. Fanning turned, looking for the waiter to ask for the check. Ah, come on, sugar, loosen up, will ya, his wife coaxed. Him. One of the dancers had given the American lady her rose, and Mrs. Fanning now tried to stick it in her husband's lapel. Dr. Farming narrowed his eyes at her, but before he could speak, the table was presented with a complimentary bottle of champagne from the management. As the cork popped, a few of the customers in adjoining tables applauded and lifted their glasses up in a toast to Mrs. Fanning. A toast to all of us. MRS. Fanning held up her glass. Come on, girls, she urged them. Sandy's sisters lifted their water glasses and clinked the American ladies. Sandy, her mother said. You too. Reluctantly, Sandy lifted her glass. Dr. Fanning held up his glass and tried to inject a pointed seriousness into the moment, to you, the Garcias. Welcome to this country. Now her parents lifted their glasses, and in her father's eyes, Sandy noted gratitude and in her mother's eyes a moistness that meant barely checked tears. As Dr. Fanning spoke to one of the waiters, a dancer approached the table, carrying a large straw basket with a strap that went around her neck. She tipped the basket towards the girls and smiled a wide, warm smile at the two men. Inside the basket were a dozen dark-haired Barbie dolls dressed like Spanish senoritas. The dancer held up a doll and puffed out the skirt of its dress so that it opened prettily like a fully blown flower. Would you like one? She asked little Fifi. The woman spoke in English, but her voice was heavily accented like Dr. Garcia's. Fifi nodded eagerly, then looked over at her mother, who was eyeing the little girl. Slowly Fifi shook her head. No, the dancer said in a surprised voice, lifting up her eyebrows. She looked at the other girls, her eye falling on Sandy. You would like one. Sandy, of course, remembered the much repeated caution to the girls that they should not ask for any special dishes or treats of any sort. The Garcias could not afford extras, and they did not want to put their hosts in the embarrassing position of having to spend money out of largess. Sandy stared at the small doll. She was a perfect replica of the beautiful dancers, dressed in a long, glittery gown with a pretty tortoise shell comb in her hair, from which cascaded a tiny, lacy mantilla. On her feet were strapped tiny black heels such as the dancers had worn. Sandy ignored her mother's fierce look and reached out for the doll. With the tip of her painted fingernail, the dancer sales girl showed the miniature castanets the doll was holding. Sandy felt such tenderness as when a new mother uncurls the tiny fists of a newborn. She turned to her father, ignoring her mother's glare. Poppy, can I have her? Her father looked up at the pretty sales girl and smiled. 
Sandy could tell he wanted to make an impression. Sure, he nodded, adding, anything for my girl. The sales girl smiled. Instantly the cry from the other three, me too, Poppy. Me too. Her mother reached over and took the doll from Sandy's hands. Absolutely not, girls. She shook her head at the dancer, who had since reached in her basket and extracted three more dolls. Meanwhile the check had been brought, and Dr. Fanning was reviewing the items, stacking bills on a little tray. As he did so, Poppy gazed down at the tablecloth. Back in the old country, everyone fought for the honor of paying. But what could he do in this new country where he did not even know if he had enough cash in his pocket to make good on buying the four dolls that he was now committed to provide for his girls? You know the rules. Mommy hissed at them. Please, Mommy, please, Fifi begged, not understanding that the woman's offer of a doll did not mean they were free. No. Mommy said sharply. And no more discussion, girls. The edge on her voice made Mrs. Fanning, who had been absently collecting her things, look up. What's going on? She asked the girl's mother. Nothing, Mommy said, and smiled tensely. Sandy was not going to miss her chance. This woman had kissed her father. This woman had ruined the act of the beautiful dancers. The way Sandy saw it, this woman owed her something. We want one of those dolls. Sandy pointed to the basket in which the dancer was rearranging the rejected dolls. Sandy, her mother cried. Why, I think that's a swell idea. A souvenir. Mrs. Fanning motioned the dancer back, who approached the table with her full cargo. Give each of these girls a doll and put it on the bill. Sugar she turned to her husband, who had finished clapping the small folder closed to hold your horses. I will not permit Poppy sat forward, reaching in his back pocket for his wallet. Nonsense. Mrs. Fanning hushed him. She touched his hand to prevent him from opening his wallet. Poppy flinched and then tried to disguise his reaction by pretending to shake her hand away. I pay this. Don't take his money, MRS. Fanning ordered the dancer, who smiled non-committedly. Hey, Dr. Fanning said, agreeing with his wife. We wanted to get the girls something, but heck, we didn't know what. This is perfect. He peeled four more tens from his wad. Poppy exchanged a helpless look with Mommy. While her sisters fussed over which of the dolls to choose, Sandy grabbed the one dressed exactly like the dancers in the floor show. She stood the Barbie on the table and raised one of the doll's arms and pulled the other out so that the doll was frozen in the pose of the Spanish dancers. You are much too kind, her mother said to Mrs. Fanning, and then in a hard voice with the promise of later punishment, she addressed the four girls, what do you say? Thank you, Sandy's sisters chorused. Sandy, her mother said. Sandy looked up. Her mother's eyes were dark and beautiful like those of the little dancer before her. Yes, mommy, she asked politely, as if she hadn't heard the order. What do you say to Mrs. Fanning? Sandy turned to the woman whose blurry, alcoholic eyes and ironic smile intimated the things Sandy was just beginning to learn, things that the dancers knew all about, which was why they danced with such vehemence, such passion. She hopped her dancer right up to the American lady and gave her a bow. Mrs. Fanning giggled and returned an answering nod. Sandy did not stop. She pushed her doll closer, so that Mrs. Fanning aped a surprised, cross-eyed look. Holding her new doll right up to the American woman's face and tipping it so that its little head touched the woman's flushed cheek, Sandy made a smacking sound. Jacious, Sandy said as if the Barbie doll had to be true to her Spanish costume. 1960-1956 The blood of the conquistadores mommy, Poppy, the Fuai girls Carlos is in the pantry, getting himself a glass of water from the filtered spout when he sees the two men walking up the driveway. They are dressed in starched khaki. Each wears reflector sunglasses, 
and the gleam off the frames matches the gleam off the buckles on their holsters. Except for the guns, they could be foremen coming to collect on a bill or to supervise a job that other men will sweat over. But the guns give them away. Beside him, the old cook Shucha is fussing with a coaster for his glass. The gesture of his head towards the window alerts her. She looks up and sees the two men. Very slowly, so that in their approach they will not catch a movement at the window, Carlos lifts his finger to his lips. Chucha nods. Step by careful step, he backs out of the room, and once he is in the hall where there are no windows to the driveway, he makes a mad dash towards the bedroom. He passes the patio, where the four girls are playing statues with their cousins. 195. They are too intent on their game to notice the blur of his body running by. But Yo-Yo, just frozen in a spin, happens to look up and see him. Again, he puts his finger to his lips. Yo-Yo cocks her head, intrigued. Yo-Yo, one of the cousin cries. Yo-Yo moved. The argument erupts just as he reaches the bedroom door. He hopes Yo-Yo will keep her mouth shut. Surely the men will question her when they go through the house. Children and servants are two groups they always interrogate. In the bedroom, he opens the large walk-in closet and the inside light comes on. When he shuts the door, it goes off. He reaches for the flashlight and beams it on. Far off, he hears the children arguing, then the chiming of the doorbell. His heart is going so fast that he feels as if something, not his heart, is trapped inside. Easy now, easy. He pushes to the back of the closet behind a row of Laura's dresses. He is comforted by the talc smell of her house dresses mixed with the sunbaked smell of her skin, the perfumey smell of her party dresses. He makes sure he does not disturb the arrangement of her shoes on the floor, but steps over them and disengages the back panel. Inside is a cubicle with a vent that opens out above the shower in the bathroom, Air and a little light. A couple of towels, a throw pillow, a sheet, a chamber pot, a container of filter water, aspirin, sleeping pills, even a San Judas, patron of impossible causes, that Laura has tacked to the inside wall. The small revolver Vic has smuggled in for him just in case is wrapped snugly in an extra shirt, a dark colored shirt, and a dark colored pair of pants for escaping at night. He steps inside, sets the flashlight on the floor, and snaps the panel back, closing himself in. When she sees her father dash by, Yo-Yo thinks he is playing one of his games that nobody likes, and that mommy says are in poor taste. Like when he says, you want to hear God speak, and you have to press his nose, and he farts. Or when he asks over and over even after you say white, what color was Napoleon's white horse? or when he gives you the test of whether or not you inherited the blood of the conquistadores, and he holds you upside down by your feet until all the blood goes to your head, and he keeps asking, do you have the blood of the conquistadores? Yo-Yo always says no, until she can't stand it anymore because her head feels as if it's going to crack open, and she says yes. Then he puts her right side up and laughs a great big conquistador laugh that comes all the way from the green, motherland hills of Spain. But Poppy is not playing a game now because soon after he runs by in hide and seek, the doorbell rings, and Chucha lets in those two creepy looking men. They are coffee with milk color and the cocky they wear is the same color as their skin, so they look all beige, which no one would ever pick as a favorite color. They wear dark mirror glasses. What catches Yo-Yo's eye are their holster belts and the shiny black bulge of their guns poking through. Now she knows guns are illegal. Only guardias in uniform can carry them, so either these men are criminals or some kind of secret police in plain clothes mommy has told her about who could be anywhere at any time like guardian angels, except they don't keep you from doing bad but wait to catch you doing it. Mommy has joked with Yo-Yo that she better behave because if these secret police see her doing something wrong, they will take her away to a prison for children where the menu is a list of everything Yo-Yo doesn't like to eat. 
Chucha talks very loud and repeats what the men say as if she were deaf. She must be wanting Poppy to hear from wherever he is hiding. This must be serious like the time Yo-Yo told their neighbor, the old general, a made-up story about Poppy having a gun, a story which turned out to be true because Poppy did really have a hidden gun for some reason. The nursemaid Milagros told on Yo-Yo telling the general that story, and her parents hit her very hard with a belt in the bathroom, with the shower on so no one could hear her screams. Then mommy had to meet Tio Vic in the middle of the night with the gun hidden under her raincoat so it wouldn't be on the premises in case the police came. That was very serious. That was the time mommy still talks about when you almost got your father killed, yo-yo. Once the men are seated in the living room off the inside patio, they try to lure the children into conversation. Yo-yo does not say a word. She is sure these men have come on account of that gun story she told when she was only five and before anyone told her guns were illegal. The taller man with the gold tooth asks Mundin, the only boy here, where his father is. Mundin explains his father is probably still at the office, and so the man asks him where his mother is, and Mundin says he thinks she is home. The maid said she was not at home, the short one with a broad face says in a testy voice. It is delicious to watch him. Realize a moment later that he is in the wrong when Mundin says, you mean Tia Laura. But see, I live next door. Ah, the short one says, stretching the word out, his mouth round like the barrel of the revolver he has emptied and is passing around so the children can all hold it. Yo-Yo takes it in her hand and looks straight into the barrel hole, shuddering. Maybe it is loaded, maybe if she shot her head off, everyone would forgive her for having made up the story of the gun. So which of you girls live here, the tall one asks. Carla raises her hand as if she were at school. Sandy also raises her hand like a copycat and tells Yo-Yo and Fifi to raise their hands too. Four girls, the fat one says, rolling his eyes. No boys. They shake their heads. Your father better get good locks on the door. A worried look flashes across Fifi's face. A few days ago she turned the small rod on her bedroom doorknob by mistake and then couldn't figure out how to pop it back and unlock the door. A workman from Papito's factory had to come and take out the whole lock, making a hole in the door, and letting the hysterical Fifi out. Why locks, she asks, her bottom lip quivering. Why? The chubby one laughs. The roll of fat around his waist jiggles. Why, he keeps repeating and breaking out in fresh chuckles. Come here, Cialito Lindo, and let me show you why your poppy has to put locks on the door. He beckons to Fifi with his index finger crooked. Fifi shakes her head no, and begins to cry. Yo-Yo wants to cry, too, but she is sure if she does, the men will get suspicious and take her father away and maybe the whole family. Yo-Yo imagines herself in a jail cell. It would be like Felicidad, Mamita's little canary, in her birdcage. The guards would poke in rifles the way Yo-Yo sometimes pokes Felicidad with sticks when no one in the big house is looking. She gets herself so scared that she is on the brink of tears when she hears the car in the drive, and knows it must be, it must be. Mommy's here, she cries out, hoping this good news will stop her little sister's tears. The two men exchange a look and put their revolvers back into their holsters. Chucha grim-faced as always, comes in and announces loudly, Dona Laura is home. As she exits, she lets drop a fine powder. Her lips move the whole time as if she were doing her usual sullen, under her breath grumbling, but Yo-Yo knows she is casting a spell that will leave the men powerless, be calmed. As Laura nears her driveway, she honks the horn twice to alert the guard to open the gate, but surprisingly, it is already open. Chino is standing outside the little gatehouse talking to a man in khaki. Up ahead, Laura sees the black VW, and her heart plummets right down to her toes. Next to her in the passenger seat it has taken her months to convince the young country girl to ride in, Immaculata says, Dona, hey Visita. Laura plays along, 
controlling the tremor of her voice. Yes, company. She stops and motions for Chino to come to the car. I.K. Hey, Chino. They are looking for Don Carlos, Chino says tensely. He lowers his voice and looks over at Immaculata, who looks down at her hands. They have been here for a while. There are two more waiting in the house. I'll talk to them slash Laura says to Chino, whose slightly slanted eyes have earned him his nickname. And you go over to Dona Carmen's and tell her to call Don Victor and tell him to come right over and pick up his tennis shoes. Tennis shoes, you hear. Chino nods. He can be trusted to put two and two together. Chino has been with the family forever well, only a little less than Chucha, who came when Laura's mother was pregnant with Laura. Chino calls to the man in khaki, who flicks his cigarette onto the lawn behind him, and approaches the car. As Laura greets him, she sees Chino cutting across the lawn towards Don Mundo's house. Dona, excuse are dropping in on you slash the man is saying with false politeness that seems as if it is being wastefully squeezed from a tube. We need to ask Dr. Garcia a few questions, and at the clinica, they told us he was home. Your boy boy. Chino is over 50 he says L doctor is not home yet, so we will wait until he shows up. Surely, he is on his way the guard looks up at the sky, shielding his eyes, the sun is dead center above him, noon, time for dinner, time for every man to sit down at his table and break bread and say grace to God and Trujillo for the plenty the country is enjoying. By all means, wait for him, but please not under this hot Sunday. Laura switches into her grand manner. The grand manner will usually disarm these poor lackeys from the countryside, who have joined the sim, most of them, in order to put money in their pockets, food and rum in their stomachs, and guns at their hips. But deep down, they are still boys in rags bringing down coconuts for El Patron when he visits his fincas with his family on Sundays. You must come in and have something cold to drink. The man bows his head, grateful. But no, he must stay put, orders. Laura promises to send him down a cold beer and drives up to the house. She wonders if Carmen has been able to get hold of Victor. At the first sign of trouble, Victor said, get in touch, code phrase is tennis shoes. He is good for his word. It wasn't his fault the State Department chickened out of the plot they had him organize. And he has promised to get the men out safely. All but Fernando, of course. Pobrecito ending up the way he did, hanging himself by his belt in his cell to keep from giving out the other's names under the tortures Trujillo's henchmen were administering. Fernando, a month in his grave, San Judas protect us all. At the door she directs Immaculata to unload the groceries and be sure to take the man down at the gate of presidents the common beer they all like. Then she crosses herself and enters the house. In the living room, the two men rise to greet her, Fifi runs to her in tears, Yo-Yo is right behind, all eyes, looking frightened. Laura is raising her girl's American style, reading all the new literature, so she knows she shouldn't have beaten Yo-Yo that time the girl gave them such a scare. But you lose your head in this crazy hell hole, you do, and different rules apply. Now, for instance, she is thinking of doing something wild and mad, sinking down in a swoon the way women used to in old movies when they wanted to distract attention from some trouble spot, unbuttoning her blouse and offering the men pleasure if they'll let her husband and babies escape. Gentlemen, please slash Laura says, urging them to sit down, and then she eyeballs the kids to leave the room. They all do, except Yo-Yo and Fifi, who hold on to either side of her, not saying a word. Is there some problem? Laura begins. We just have a few questions to ask Don Carlos. Are you expecting him for the noon meal? At this moment, a way to delay these men comes to her. Vic is on his way, she hopes, and he'll know how to handle this mess. My husband had a tennis game today with Victor Hubbard. She says the name slowly so that it will register. The game probably ran a little late. Make yourselves at home. 
please. My house, your house, she says, reciting the traditional Dominican welcome. She excuses herself a moment to prepare a tray of little snacks they urge her not to trouble herself to prepare. In the pantry, Shucha is alone since Immaculata has gone off to serve the guard his beer. The old black woman and the young mistress exchange looks. Don Carlos, Shucha mouths, in the bedroom. Laura nods. She knows now where he is, and although it spooks her that he is within a few feet of these men, sealed in the secret compartment, she is also grateful that he is so close by she could almost reach out and touch him. Back in the living room, she serves the men a tray of fried plantain chips and peanuts and cassavi and pours each one a precedente in the cheap glasses she keeps for servants. Seeing The men eye the plates, she remembers the story that Trujillo forces his cooks to taste his food before he eats. Laura breaks off a piece of cassavi for Fifi on one side of her, and another for Yo-Yo. Then she herself takes a handful of peanuts and puts them, like a schoolgirl, one by one in her mouth. The men reach out their hands and eat. When the phone rings at Dona Tatica's, she feels the sound deep inside her sore belly. Bad news, she thinks. Candelario, be at my side. She picks the phone up as if it had claws, and announces in a small voice, so unlike hers, Buenos dias, El Paraiso, Paya Cerveral. The voice on the other end is the American secretary, a no-nonsense, too much schooling in her voice woman who does not return Tatica's Buenos Dias. Embassy business, the voice snaps, please call Don Vic to the phone. Tatica echoes the secretary's snippiness, I cannot disturb him. But the voice gloats back, urgent, and Tatica must obey. She heads across the courtyard towards Casita number 6. Large enough already inside her broad, caramel-colored body, Tatica renders herself dramatically larger by always dressing in red, a payamisa she has made to her santo, Candelario, so he will cure her of the horrible burning in her gut. The doctor went in and cut out some of her stomach and all of her woman machinery, but Candelario stayed, filling that empty space with spirit. Now whenever trouble is coming, Tatica feels a glimmer of the old burning in the centipede trail on her belly. Something pretty bad is on its way because with each step Tatika takes, the pain roils in her gut, trouble coming to full term. Under the Amapola tree, the yard boy is lounging with the American's chauffeur. When he sees her, quick he busies himself clipping a sorry looking hedge. The chauffeur calls out, Buenos dias, Dona Tatika, and tips his cap at Tatika who lifts her head high above his riffraff. Casita number 6. Don Victor's regular cabin, is straight ahead. The air conditioner is going. Tatika will have to pound hard with strength she does not have so her knock will be heard. At the door she pauses. Candelario, she pleads as she lifts her hand to knock, for the burning has spread. Urgent, she calls out, meaning her own condition now, for her whole body feels bathed in a burning pain as if her flame-colored dress were itself on fire. A goddamn bang comes at the goddamn door. Telefono, urgent, Senor Hubbard. Vic does not lose a beat, but calls out, on Matuto, and finishes first. He shakes his head at the sweet giggling thing and says, Excuse, poor favor. Half the time he doesn't know whether he's using his CIA crash course in Spanish or his prep school Latin or his college French. But dicks and dollars are what talk in El Paraiso anyway. When he first got to this little hot spot, Vic didn't know how hot it would be. Immediately, he looked up his old classmate Mundo, who comes from one of those old wealthy families who send their kids to the states to prep school, and the boys on to college. Old buddy introduced him around till he knew every firebrand among the upper class fellas the state department wanted him to groom for revolution. Fellas got him fixed up with Tatika, who has kept him in the little girls he likes, hot. Little numbers, dark and sweet like the little cups of cafecito so full of goddamn caffeine and island sugar you're shaking half the day. Vic dresses quickly, and as soon as his clothes are on, he is all business. Hasta luego, 
he says, waving to the little girl sitting up and pouting prettily. Behave yourself, he jokes. Naughtily, she lifts her little chin. Really, they are so cute. He opens the door onto a crumbling Tataka, 200 pounds going limp in his arms. He looks up and sees over her shoulder his chauffeur and the yard boy rushing to his aid. Behind him, above the air conditioner's roar, he can hear the little girl shout Dona Tataka's name, and as if summoned back from the hell hole of her pain, Tataka's eyes roll up, her mouth parts. Telefono, urgent, Ambajata, she whispers to Don Vic, and he takes off, leaving her to collapse into the arms of her own riffraff. Vic goes first to Mundo's house, since the call came from Carmen, and finds her in the patio with endless kitties having their noon meal at the big table. Carmen rushes towards him. Jacious adios, Vic, she says for hello. A sweetheart, this little lady, not bad legs either. Unfortunately, the nuns got to her young, and Vic has nodded himself silly several times to catechism lessons disguised as dinner conversations. He wonders if it shows all over him where he's been, and grins, thinking back on the sweet little number not much older than some of the little sirens sitting around the table now. Tio Vic, Tio Vic, they call out. Honestly, lash me to a lamp post, he thinks. Quick look around the table. No sign of Mundo. Maybe he's had to take refuge in the temporary holding closet Vic advised. Him and the others to construct? He smiles comfortingly at Carmen, whose smile back is a grimace of fear. In the study slash she directs him. The kids keep calling for Tio Vic to come over to the lunch table they are not allowed to leave. He waves at them and says, carry on, troops, as he goes by. Over his shoulder, he hears Carmen call after him, have you eaten, Victor? These Latin women, even when the bullets are flying and the bombs are falling, they want to make sure you have a full stomach, your shirt is ironed, your handkerchief is fresh. It's what makes the nice girls from polite society great hostesses, and the girls at Tatakas such obliging lovers. He taps on the door, says his name, waits, says it again, a little louder this time since the air conditioner is going. The door opens eerily as if by itself since no one admits him. He enters, the door closes behind him, a gun safety clicks off. Whoa, fellas, he calls out, lifting his hands to show he's there unarmed, honest to God buddy. The jalousies have all been closed, and the men are spread around the room as if assuming lookout posts. Mundo comes out from behind the door, and Fidelio, the nervous one, stands by the bookshelves, pulling books in and out as if they were levers that might work their safe escape out of this frightening moment. Mateo squats, as if lighting a fire. Standing by different windows are the rest of the guys. Jesus, they look like a bunch of scared rabbits. Thought you might be Sim, Mundo says, explaining his withdrawn gun. He pulls a chair out for his buddy. The chairs in his study bear the logo from their alma mater, Yale, which Vic notes the family mispronounces as jail. What's up? Vic asks in his heavily accented Spanish. Trouble, says Mundo. With a capital T. Vic nods. We're on slash he says to the group. Operation Zapatos Tennis. Then he does what he has always done ever since back in Indiana as a boy the shit first began hitting fan, he cracks his knuckles and grins. Carla and Sandy are having their lunch at Tia Carmen's house, which is not breaking the rules because, number one, mommy told them to scram with her widened eyes, and number two, the rule is that unless you're grounded, you can eat at any aunt's house if you let mommy know first, which goes back to, number one, that mommy told them to scram, and it is already almost an hour since they should have eaten back home. Something is fishy like when mommy walks in on them and they quick hide what they don't want her to see, and she clips her nose together with her fingers and says, I smell a rat. Fishy is Tio Mundo arriving for lunch, then not even sitting down but going straight to his study, 
and then all the uncles coming like there's going to be a party or a big family decision about Mamita's drinking or about Pepito's businesses while he's away. Tia Carmen jumps up each time the doorbell rings, and when she returns, she asks them the same question she's just asked them so you were playing statues and the two men came. Munden is jabbering away about the gun he got to hold. Every time he mentions it, Carla can see a shiver go through Tia's body like when there's a draft up at the house in the mountains and all the ants wear pretty shawls. Today, though, it's so hot, the kids got to go in the pool in the morning right before statues, and Tia says if they're very good, they might be able to go in again after their digestion is completed. Twice in the pool in one day and Tia has the shivers in this heat. Something very fishy is going on. Tia rings the little silver bell, and Adela comes out and clears all the plates, and brings dessert, which always includes the Russell Stover box with the paint Eden bow. When the box goes around, you have to figure out by eyesight alone which one you think will have the nut inside or caramel or coconut, hoping that you won't be surprised when you bite in by some squishy center you want to spit out. The Russell Stover box is pretty low because no one has been to the United States lately to buy chocolates. Pepito and Mamita left right after Christmas as usual but haven't come back. And it's August already. Mommy says that's because of Mamita's health, and having to see specialists, but Carla has heard whispers that Pepito has resigned his United Nations post and so is not very well liked by the government right now. Every once in a while guardias roar in on their jeeps, jump out, and surround Pepito's house, and then Chino always comes running and tells Mommy, who calls Tio Vic to tell him to come pick up his tennis shoes. Carla has never seen Tio Vic bring any kind of shoes to the house but the pockmarked ones he wears. He always comes in one of those limousines Carla's only seen at weddings and when Trujillo goes by in a motorcade. Tio Vic talks to the head guardia and gives him some money, and they all climb back in their jeeps and roar away. It's really kind of neat, like a movie. But mommy says they're not to tell their friends about it. No flies fly into a closed mouth, she explains when Carla asks, why can't we tell? The Russell Stover box has gone all the way around back to Tia, who takes out one of the little papery molds, and sighs when the kids argue about who will get it. Tio Vic comes out, grinning, and ruffles Munden's hair, puts his hand on Tia's shoulder and asks the whole table, so who wants to go to New York? Who wants to see the Empire State Building? Tio Vic always talks to them in English so that they get practice. How about the Statue of Liberty? At first, the cousins look around at each other, not wanting to embarrass themselves by calling out, me. Me, and then having Tio Vic cry, April Fool. But tentatively Carla, and then Sandy, and then Lucinda raise their hands. Like a chain reaction, hand after hand goes up, some still holding Russell Stover chocolates. Me, me, I want to go, I want to go. Tio Vic lifts up his hands, palms out, to keep their voices down. When they are all quiet, waiting for him to pick the winners, he looks down at Tia Carmen beside him and says, how about it, Carmen? Wanna go? And the kids all chant, yes, Tia, yes. Carla, too, until she notes that her aunt's hands are shaking as she fits the lid on the empty Russell Stover box. Laura is terrified she is going to say something she mustn't. These two thugs have been quizzing her for half an hour. Thank God for Yo-Yo and Fifi hanging on her, whining. She makes a big deal of asking them what they want, of getting them to recite for the company, and trying to get sullen little Fifi to smile for the obnoxious fat man. Finally what a relief. There's Vic crossing the lawn with Carla and Sandy on each hand. The two men turn and, almost, reflexively, their hands travel to their holsters. Their gesture reminds her of a man fondling his genitals. It might be this vague sexuality behind the violence around her that has turned Laura off lovemaking all these months. Victor, she calls out, 
and then in a quieter voice she cues the men as if she does not want them to embarrass themselves by not knowing who this important personage is. Victor Hubbard, Consul at the Embajada Americana. Excuse me, senors. She comes down the patio and gives Vic a little peck on the cheek, whispering as she does, I've told them he's been playing tennis with you. Vic gives her the slightest nod, all the while grinning as if his teeth were on review. Effusively, Laura greets Carla and Sandy. My darlings, my sweet cuckwatas, have you eaten? They nod, watching her closely, and she sees with a twinge of pain that they are quickly picking up the national language of a police state, every word, every gesture, a possible minefield, watch what you say, look, where you go. With the men, Victor is jovial and back patting, asking twice for their names, as if he means to pass on a compliment or a complaint. The men shift hams, nervous for the first time, Laura notes gleefully. The doctor, we have come to ask him a few questions, but he seems to have disappeared. Not at all, Vic corrects them. We were just playing tennis. He'll be home any minute. The men sit up, alert. Vic goes on to say that if there is some problem, perhaps he can straighten things out. After all, the doctor is a personal friend. Laura watches their reactions as Vic tells them news that is news to her. The doctor has been granted a fellowship at a hospital in the United States, and he, Victor, has just heard the family's papers have received clearance from the head of immigration. So, why would the good doctor get into any trouble? So, Laura thinks. So the papers have cleared and we are leaving. Now everything she sees sharpens as if through the lens of lost the orchids in their hanging straw baskets, the row of apothecary jars Carlos has found for her in old druggists throughout the countryside, the rich light shafts swarming with a golden pollen. She will miss this glorious light warming the inside of her skin and jeweling the trees, the grass, the lily pond beyond the hedge. She thinks of her ancestors, those fair-skinned conquistadores arriving in this new world, not knowing that the gold they sought was this blazing light. And look at what they started, Laura thinks, looking up and seeing gold flash in the mouth of one of the guadias as it spreads open in a scared smile. This morning when the fag at the corner sold them their Lateria tickets, he said, watch yourselves, the flames of your santos burn just above your heads. The hand of God descends and some are lifted up, but some he looked from Pupo to Checo some are cast away. Pupo took heed and crossed himself, but Checo twisted the fag's arm behind his back and threatened to give his manhood the hand of God. It scares Pupo the meanness that comes out of Checo's mouth, as if they weren't both campesino cousins, ear twisted to church on Sundays by mothers who raised them on faith and whatever grew in their little plot of dirt. But the fag Lateria guy was right. The day began to surprise them. First, Don Fabio calls them in. Special assignment, they are to report on this Garcia doctor's comings and goings. Next thing Pupo knows Checo is driving the jeep right up to the Garcia house and doing this whole search number that is not following orders. Point is, though, that if something comes out of the search, their enterprise will be praised and they will be decorated and promoted. If nothing turns up and the family has connections, then back they go to the prison beat, cleaning interrogation rooms and watering down the cells the poor. Scared bastards dirty with their loss of self-control. From the minute they enter the house Pupo can tell by the way the old Haitian woman acts that this is a stronghold of something, call it arms, call it spirits, call it money. When the woman arrives, she is nervous and grasshoppery, smiling falsely, dropping names like a trail of crumbs to the powerful. Mostly, she mentions the red-haired gringo at the embassy. At first Pupo thinks she's just bluffing and he's already congratulating Checo and himself for uncovering something hot. But then, sure enough, the red-haired gringo appears before them, two more doll girls in either hand. Who is your supervisor? The gringo's voice has an itch. When Checo informs him, the American throws back his head, oh, Fabio, of course. 
Pupo sees Checo's mouth stretch in a rubber band smile that seems as if it may snap. They have detained a lady from an important family. They have maybe barked up the wrong tree. All Pupo knows is Don Fabio is going to have a heyday on their already scarred backs. I'll tell you what, the American consul offers them. Why don't I just give old Fabio a call right now? Pupo lifts his shul. Durs and ducks his head as if just the mention of his superior's name could cause his head to roll. Checo nods, ASUS or Denny's. The American calls from the phone in the hall where Pupo can hear him talking his marbles in his mouth Spanish. There is a silence in which he must be waiting to be connected, but then his voice warms up. Fabio, about this little misunderstanding. Tell you what, I'll talk to immigration myself, and I'll have the doctor out of the country in 48 hours. On the other end Don Fabio must have made a joke because. The American breaks out in laughter, then calls Checo to the phone so his supervisor can speak with him. Pupo hears his comrade's rare apologetic tone. S.I., S.I., como no, Don Fabio, immediate amend. Pupo sits among these strange white people, ashamed and cornered. Already he is feeling the whip coming down like judgment on his bared back. They are all strangely quiet, listening to Checo's voice full of disclaimer, and when he falls silent, only to their own breathing as the hand of God draws closer. Whether it will pick up the saved or cast out the lost is unclear yet to Pupo, who picks up his empty glass and, for comfort, tinkles the ice. While the men were saying their goodbyes at the door, Sandy stayed on the couch sitting on her hands. Fifi and Yo-Yo clustered around Mommy, balling up her skirt with holding on, Fifi wailing every time the big fat guard bent down for a goodbye kiss from her. Carla, knowing better as the oldest, gave her hand to the men and curtsied the way they'd been taught to do for guests. Then, everyone came back to the living room, and... Mommy rolled her eyes at Tio Vic the way she did when she was on the phone with someone she didn't want to talk to. Soon, she had everyone in motion, the girls were to go to their bedrooms and make a stack of their best clothes and pick one toy. They wanted to take on this trip to the United States. Navia and Milagros and Mommy would later pack it for them. Then, Mommy disappeared with Tio Vic into her bedroom. Sandy followed her sisters into their side-by-side -side bedrooms. They stood in a scared little huddle, feeling strangely careful with each other. Yo-Yo turned to her. What are you taking? Fifi had already decided on her baby doll and Carla was going through her private box of jewelry and mementos. Yo-Yo fondled her revolver. It was strange how when held up to the absolute phrase the one toy I really want nothing quite filled the hole that was opening wide inside Sandy. Not the doll whose long hair you could roll and comb into hairdos, not the loom for making pot holders that mommy was so thankful for, not the glass dome that you turned over and pretty flakes fell on a little red house in the woods. Nothing would quite fill that need, even years after, not the pretty woman she would surprise herself by becoming, not the prizes for her schoolwork and scholarships to study now this and now that she couldn't decide to stay with, not the men that held her close and almost convinced her when. Their mouths came down hard on her lips that this, this was what Sandy had been missing. From the dark of the closet Carlos has heard tones, not content, known presences, not personalities. He wonders if this might be what he felt as a small child before the impressions and tones and presences were overlaid by memories, memories which are mostly others' stories about his past. He is the youngest of his father's 35 children, 25 legitimate, 15 from his own mother, the second wife he has no past of his own. It is not just a legacy, a future, you don't get as the youngest. Primogeniture is also the clean slate of the oldest making the past out of nothing but faint whispers, presences, and tones. Those tenuous, tentative first life impressions have scattered like reflections in a pond under the swirling hand of an older brother or sister saying, I remember the day you ate the rat poison, Carlos, or, I remember the day you fell down the stairs he has heard Laura in the living room speaking with two men, 
one of them with a ripply, tricky voice, the other with a coarser voice, a thicker laugh, a big man, no doubt. Fifi is there and Yo-Yo as well. The two other girls disappeared in a jabber of cousins earlier. Fifi whines periodically, and Yo-Yo has recited something for the men, he can tell from the sing-song in her voice. Laura's voice is tense and bright like a newly sharpened knife that every time she speaks cuts a little sliver from her self-control. Carlos thinks, she will break, she will break, San Judas, let her not break. Then, in that suffocating darkness, having to go but not daring to pee in the chamber pot for fear the men might hear a drip in the walls though God knows, he and Mundo soundproof this room enough so that there is no ventilation at all in that growing claustrophobia, he hears her say distinctly. Victor. Sure enough, momentarily the monotone, garbled. Voice of the American consul nears the living room. By now, of course, they all know his consulship is only a front Vic is, in fact, a CIA agent whose orders changed midstream from organize the underground and get that sob out to hold your horses, let's take a second look around to see what's best. For us. When he hears the bedroom door open, Carlos puts his ear up against the front panel. Steps go into the bathroom, the shower is turned on, and then the fan to block out any noise of talk. The immediate effect is that fresh air begins to circulate in the tiny compartment. The closet door opens, and then Carlos hears her breathing close by on the other side of the wall. Two I'm the one who doesn't remember anything from that last day on the island because I'm the youngest and so the other three are always telling me what happened that last day. They say I almost got Poppy killed on account of I was so mean to one of the secret police who came looking for him. Some weirdo who was going to sit me on his hard on and pretend we were playing ride the cock horse to Banbury Cross. But then whenever we start talking last day on the island memories, and someone says, Fifi, you almost got Poppy killed for being so rude to that Gestapo guy, Yo-Yo starts in on how it was she who almost got Poppy killed when she told that story about the gun years before our last day on the island. Like we're all competing, right? For the most haunted past. I can tell you one thing I do remember from right before. We left. There was this old lady, Shucha, who had worked in mommy's family forever and who had this face like someone had wrung it out after washing it to try to get some of the black out. I mean, Shucha was super wrinkled and Haitian blue black, not Dominican cafe con leche black. She was real Haitian too and that's why she couldn't say certain words like the word for parsley or anyone's name that had a slash in it, which meant the family was like camp, everyone with nicknames Chucha could pronounce. She was always in a bad mood not exactly a bad mood, but you couldn't get her to crack a smile or cry or anything. It was like all her emotions were spent, on account of everything she went through in her young years. Way back before mommy was even born, Shucha had just appeared at my grandfather's doorstep one night, begging to be taken in. Turns out it was the night of the massacre when Trujillo had decreed that all black Haitians on our side of the island would be executed by dawn. There's a river the bodies were finally thrown into that supposedly still runs red to this day, 50 years later. Chucha had escaped from some Kinepicker's camp and was asking for asylum. Pepito took her in, poor skinny little thing, and I guess Mamita taught her to cook and iron and clean. Chucha was like a nun who had joined the convent of the De La Torre clan. She never married or went anywhere even on her days off. Instead, she'd close herself up in her room and pray for any De La Torre souls stuck up in purgatory. Anyhow, that last day on the island, we were in our side-by-side -side bedrooms, the four girls, setting out our clothes for going to the United States. The two creepy spies had left, and Mommy and Tio Vic were in the bedroom. They were telling Poppy, who was hidden in the secret closet, about how we would all be leaving in Tio Vic's limo for the airport for a flight he was going to get us. I know, I know, it sounds like something you saw on Miami Vice, but all I'm doing is repeating what I've heard from the family. But here's what I do remember of my last day on the island. 
Chucha came into our bedrooms with this bundle in her hands, and Navia, who was helping us pack, said to her in a gruff voice, What do you want, old woman? None of the maids liked Chucha because they all thought she was kind of below them, being so black and Haitian and all. Chucha, though, just gave Navia one of her spelling looks, and all of sudden, Navia remembered that she had to iron our outfits for wearing on the airplane. Chucha started to unravel her bundle, and we all guessed she was about to do a little farewell voodoo on us. Chucha always had a voodoo job going, some spell she was casting or spirit she was courting or enemy she was punishing. I mean, you'd open a closet door, and there, in the corner behind your shoes, would sit a jar of something wicked that you weren't supposed to touch. Or you'd find a candle burning in her room right in front of someone's picture and a little dish with a cigar on it and red and white crepe streamers on certain days crisscrossing her room. Mommy finally had to give her a room to herself because none of the other maids wanted to sleep with her. I can see why they were afraid. The maid said she got mounted by spirits. They said she cast spells on them. And besides, she slept in her coffin. No kidding. We were forbidden to go into her room to see it, but we were always sneaking back there. To take a peek. She had her mosquito net rigged up over it, so it didn't look that strange like a real uncovered coffin with a dead person inside. At first, mommy wouldn't let her do it, sleep in her coffin, I mean. She told Shucha civilized people had to sleep on beds, coffins were for corpses. But Shucha said she wanted to prepare herself for dying and couldn't one of the carpenters at Papito's factory measure her and build her a wooden box that would serve as her bed for now and her coffin later. Mommy kept saying, nonsense, Shucha, don't get tragic. The thing was, you couldn't stand in Chucha's way even if you were mommy. Soon there were jars in mommy's closet, and her picture from when she was a baby being held by Chucha was out on Chucha's altar with mints on a little tin dish, and a constant votary candle going. Inside of a week, mommy relented. She said poor Chucha never asked for a blessed thing from the family, and had always been so loyal and good, and so, heavens to Betsy, if sleeping in her coffin would make the old woman happy, mommy would have a nice box built for her, and she did. It was plain pine, like Chucha wanted it, but inside, mommy had it lined in purple cushiony fabric, which was Chucha's favorite color, and bordered with white eyelet. So here's the part I remember about that last day. Once Navia left the room, Chucha stood us all up in front of her. Chachas she always called us that, from muchachas, girls, which is how come we had ended up nicknaming her a play echo of her name for us, Chucha. You are going to a strange land. Something like that, I mean, I don't remember the exact words. But I do remember the piercing look she gave me as if she were actually going inside. My head. 